and we're going to get started. All right, everyone, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us in tonight's session of the Belize Real Estate Closing Process in Belize. I have brought on with us attorney Ryan Robel to help walk us through this process because, as you can imagine, it is quite different than closing on real estate in North America. There are a lot of little pieces that you need to know about in order to make the process as smooth and efficient for you as possible. Uh, personally, I've been coming down to Belize since 2012 from New York originally, and I remember the first time I bought property in 2016, I really had no idea what I was doing. I don't think I even got my title for it until right before COVID. It was like February 2020. And that's just because I really didn't know what I needed to do in order to process the title. Since then, I've been working with Ryan's group for all of my personal transactions and things have gone very, very smoothly, which is why I wanted to bring him on with us today because he really knows what he's doing. His team knows what he's doing. And with that, I'm going to mute myself, stop mm -hmm. my video and uh, hand the remote over to Ryan to fill us in a little bit more about what this process looks like. Ryan. All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for that introduction, Rachel. I appreciate that. Uh, I don't. Um, OK, we're good now on the slide. Uh, my name is Ryan Robel. I am the managing partner of Robel and Company LLP, Attorneys at Law. We're based here in Belize City, uh, but we do work countrywide. Uh, I am uh, originally from Buffalo, New York. I've been in Belize permanently for 18 years. Uh, our office, uh, my practice, law practice, is going on our, uh, our 12th year now. And uh, we are a heavy uh, real estate transactional law firm. So it's probably 60, 65% of what we do, uh, representing buyers, sellers, developers, for that matter, of real property, real estate here in Belize. Uh, we also uh, deal with retirement program, immigration uh, assistance, banking, uh, a lot of business law. Um, we know how to do business in Belize and we know how to um, steer you in the right direction to make sure that your interests are protected. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I should say that I am, I did go to law school in the state of New York and I am uh, licensed to practice law in the state of New York as well as Belize. And I subsequently got called to the bar in Jamaica uh, too, uh, where I had to do some additional training to become a, a member of the bar here in Belize and, and acquire a license to practice law. Uh, before my time in Belize, I actually did a master's in law over in the United Kingdom at uh, University College of London. Now, um, speak to you, uh, start the presentation, a little bit about Belize for those that don't know too much about our history. I'm a big history aficionado. Uh, we used to be called British Honduras. We were a crown colony of the United Kingdom um, and uh, achieved independence September 21st, 1981. So relatively new country, young country, um, a lot of potential, a lot of opportunity in Belize. Uh, one of the best uh, things that we have going on for us here are, would be our legal system that's based on English common law. Uh, very similar, a lot more similarities rather than differences as it uh, relates to laws in the United States, Canada, Australia, certainly England, of course. I can tell you that going to law school in New York, uh, my first year law classes were English common law based. Uh, so throughout the English speaking world, when we're talking about legal training, uh, contract law, criminal law real property law for that matter. It all has a basis in English common law. And then we, as we move further on in our studies, we kind of tailor it to those particular jurisdictions. So where I'm going with that? Well, the laws here in Belize, there's a lot more similarities and differences um, if you're coming from another common law jurisdiction like the United States or Canada. Uh, real property or land law here in Belize is governed by different local acts. Um, and depending on the location, uh, you might have a different title. And I'll go into and speak on the, the different types of titles that we have here in Belize for, for real estate. <clears throat> here is a list of uh, the various acts that um, relate to real property law uh, here in Belize. And I'll go in depth uh, on each of these a little bit on further slides. Uh, first and foremost, I can give you kind of a broad overview on the real estate purchase and transfer procedure. So typically, uh, clients come to us once they've identified a target property and probably verbally negotiated a price uh, with, for that property with a real estate agent or directly with the seller. At that point, um, I, uh, for the majority of times, uh, we are retained and we start working at that point, drafting a purchase and sale agreement on behalf of our client or uh, reviewing and uh, advising on a purchase and sale agreement or offer that is put to, put to our client. Um, once we have a document, a purchase and sale agreement executed, it's pretty much tradition in Belize to put 10% uh, 
uh, of that consideration of purchase price into an escrow account with a licensed attorney at law. Uh, our office does maintain uh, escrow accounts both in United States dollars as well as Belize dollars. We actually have our escrow account, United States dollar escrow account at Wells Fargo Bank as well as Chase Bank in the United States. So as I mentioned, traditionally 10% gets put into escrow upon a full, uh, fully executed purchase and sale agreement. After that point, uh, we go into what I call our due diligence period, where our office would conduct a comprehensive title search. We are searching the root of title with the Ministry of Natural Resources, ensuring that there's no clouds in that title, no encumbrances uh, on the land. Uh, we're looking for outstanding property taxes, outstanding mortgages, uh, liens, um, any defects in the title itself. Uh, once we get done with that portion of the search, and that's done in Belmopan, our capital city, again, at the Ministry of Natural Resources, after that portion of the search, we come back here to Belize City and we investigate the records held at the General Registry of the Supreme Court of Belize. We are investigating the titled owner now of that property. It could be an individual, it could be a company, it could be a partnership for that matter. What we're looking for and what we hope not to find would be any ongoing litigation, uh, any outstanding judgments or orders against that property owner, the seller, anything that may impede the free transferability of fee simple title. Once we're complete uh, and we finish up with the search at the General Registry of the Supreme Court, we issue a title report to our client. Um, chances are everything will be in order. And as long as they are in order, then we move on to, uh, to the drafting of what we call transfer instruments or transfer documents. These would be documents here in Belize that are executed, signed by both the buyer as well as the seller. Uh, typically, you know, the majority of times, neither the buyer nor the seller are physically located in Belize. So our office uses FedEx to send these documents around to get ink signatures. Uh, once they come back into our office, we hold what we call documentary escrow. We hold those documents in escrow pending closing. At closing, we act on behalf of, of the, the parties and have what we call carriage of title. So we physically carry those documents to the land registry uh, or the land titles unit, depending on what type of uh, property or title we're talking about here, um, and record, lodge those documents in Belmopan. Uh, again, at the Ministry of Natural Resources, one of the registries. We pay re requisite filing fees and stamp duty on behalf of our, our buyer clients. And one of the, one of the uh, very important uh, services that we provide is, would be weekly follow-up with the registry. So we're, there's someone from our office at the registry every Friday. We're lodging new transfers as well as following up on those client transfers that might be in the pipeline. Uh, in a place like Belize, we, are, uh, we do have an overworked uh, bureaucracy. So it's very important to ensure that documents are not lost within the registry, that there's a, a subtle push and follow-up to ensure that documents are processed in an efficient and professional manner. Uh, a lot of times and a lot of problems that I've heard from people, uh, they may have used uh, offices that, are, that do not have regular uh, follow-up with the registries. And a lot of times uh, your documents may sink to the bottom of the stack, perhaps get lost. So that's one thing that I'm very proud of in our office. We, we are there on a, there, the registry on a weekly basis every Friday to make sure that nothing's lost and everything is uh, processed accordingly. That's a, a transfer of land form that's used for registered land in Belize. Registered land is one of three forms of title. And again, I'll, I'll go into these various uh, titles. I talk a little bit about legal services and fee uh, fees. The Bar Association suggests a fee of two to 4% of the purchase price uh, for, for legal services. Um, I can tell you that our office provides comprehensive legal ser services. So from start to finish, you're covered, uh, your interests are protected, and uh, we zealously represent our clients and treat, treat our clients' matters as if they're our own. Um, it includes uh, everything that's on this slide and then some. Uh, if anyone has any interest in very particular or specifics as far as services are concerned, the way our office works, we issue an engagement letter that it provides detail on our proposed legal services as well as the associated professional fees. Uh, we let you read that over. Uh, I offer free consultations on real property, make sure that everyone understands uh, what they're getting into um, as it relates to purchasing real property here in Belize. And then if you're comfortable moving forward, we ask that you sign that engagement letter, provide us with a retainer, and um, we, get, we get going with the representation. 
Stamp duty, uh, for those of you who don't know what stamp duty is, it's effectively a transfer tax on real property transfers. And it's not only real property transfers, it's actually a tax on government documents. So for example, I'm, I'm a notary public in Belize. Uh, every notarization that I do in this country, I have to affix a dollar or 50 worth of postage stamps. And that's actually the stamp tax. That's how government gets their piece of their tax on that particular government document. But for real property purchases or purposes rather, land transfers, uh, there is a 5% or 8% transfer tax or stamp duty assessment. Uh, the difference in percentage uh, assessment, if you are a Belizean, if you are a CARICOM national, that would be a, a citizen of one of our sister countries, uh, English speaking Caribbean countries like Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, Bahamas, uh, you would pay 5% of the consideration or purchase price or market value of the property, whichever amount is higher. And that language comes right out of our Stamp Duties Act. Now, if you are not a Belizean or not a CARICOM national, you pay 8%, again, of the purchase price or market value of that property. I often get the question, well, who determines the market value or what amount is higher? There is a valuation section in the lands department uh, that vets all land transfers that are going through, uh, through the Ministry of natural resources, and they make an assessment. And for the most part, uh, they do not make a reassessment, but it happens at times if people uh, list a lower value uh, or get a, a, a great sale price that's far below market value. Again, the tax assessment is on either the purchase price or uh, the market value, whichever is higher. It's noteworthy that the first Belize $20,000 of value is exempt from stamp duty. Uh, that would be US $10,000 worth of value. So you start counting after that amount. Also, if you're buying a furnished, fully furnished property, a condominium, condominium unit or a fully furnished home, the value of the chattels, the contents of that home, uh, movable assets like furniture, appliances, art, what have you, that is not taxable. That is not stamp duty assessable. So really stamp duty is assessed on the value of the land, underlying land itself, and any structures thereon, but not the contents once again. And as I mentioned before, uh, it is governed by the Stamp Duties Act. Um, kind of a historical note, uh, stamp duty uh, for any American viewers here, stamp duty is what uh, the colonists uh, were revolting against in the Boston Tea Party, the uh, stamp tax that was on tea and government documents associated with tea in Boston Harbor. Uh, so we still have stamp duty or stamp tax here in Belize uh, all these years later. Uh, conveyancing system, and now we're going into the different types of land title and different systems here. So the conveyancing system, uh, the type of title that you would receive is called a deed of conveyance. And you may have heard of this before, and this is something that's very popular in Canada and the United States as well. This in Belize is for rural land. So land that is not located in urban areas, not, not our cities or towns, uh, typically what we would call bushland or lesser developed keys. Uh, it's good, solid title. It's just a different form of title. And again, it's for rural uh, land, typically agricultural land, uh, jungle land. It is governed by the General Registry Act. And once again, the title itself is evidenced by a deed of conveyance. And on the slide there, you see a little example of one of our local deeds of a conveyance. Second form of title is called the Torrent System. Uh, the title itself is either an FCT, if it's the first issuance of the title, or a TCT, Transfer Certificate of Title, if it's the second or subsequent transfers. This uses the mirror principle. It's actually a, a land system that was set up in New Zealand uh, back in the 60s and 70s. The mirror principle being the government issues two titles, identical. Uh, they're big pieces of paper, larger than the legal size paper, hard stock. You see an example here on the slide. Both those duplicate titles are, they're a mirror of each other. They're a mirror image. And anytime there may be a change in the title or some type of encumbrance like a mortgage or charge uh, or lien, um, they would appear right on the face of the title and they would be updated on both portions, uh, both copies. One copy that's held at the registry, held with government, the other copy that is in uh, the owner, the property owner's hands. And moving on to our third form of title in Belize. Uh, well, this is an example of a transfer certificate of title. Again, on the slide, it looks a bit small, but I can tell you that's a very large document. You'll notice on the right-hand side uh, in that right column, there is a memorandum there. That is where any uh, mortgages, any liens, anything that affects the title would be printed on its face. So you can tell if there's any clouds on that particular title. Now the third form of title, uh, what we would call a land certificate, 
This is land that is typically located in urban areas. So if we're talking about Belize City or San Pedro Town, uh, Placencia Village, in fact, the whole of the Placencia Peninsula, or any of our major towns, San Ignacio, Corozal Town, uh, some of the major keys outside of San Pedro, Key Cocker, St. George's Key. These, uh, these areas have already been have already been surveyed by government and they've now fallen under the registered land system. They're governed by the Registered Land Act of 1977. And again, you see an example of the land certificate uh, here on the slide. Now, this is the third form of title. Again, three forms of title in Belize, depending on the location of the land. They're all rock solid title. They're all good fee simple title. Uh, it just depends on where that land is located. Eventually, someday, uh, when government gets done surveying the entire country, everything, all land holdings will be under the registered land system. Um, they're not done yet. Again, they have the major municipalities covered. Um, and I should say that all of these titles, all three of these titles, the title document itself is very similar to a motor vehicle uh, title, ownership title in, in uh, North America, whereby you surrender the physical document anytime there's a change on that title a change of ownership, a transfer of title. Um, so it's very important to keep these title documents in a safe place, a safety deposit box, uh, somewhere that, um, that you can preserve, uh, preserve that document. It's not impossible to get replacements, but it is very difficult and costly. Uh, our office does offer safekeeping services. We do uh, have a fireproof safe that we hold government, uh, not government documents, but client documents uh, in the event that you don't want those sent around. So it is a, a service that we offer. Um, suffice to say, keep them safe. It's difficult um, and you would not be able to transfer mortgage your land if you lose that title. Uh, you can't do anything with the land until you would get a replacement. Uh, so here's some of the taxes that involve real property or land holdings in Belize. And I'll go into detail on, on each and every one of those. First, the land tax. Um, this is what would be your annual property tax. There's a couple different acts. Um, there are the Town Property Evaluation Act and Land Tax Act. Again, it really depends on where that land is located, the, the law that governs property tax. Uh, it is an annual tax. Uh, it's due uh, in April every year. And I can tell you that compared to North America, the annual property taxes are very, very low here in Belize. In fact, I would consider the taxation of real estate here in Belize to be very front end loaded. So we talked about that stamp duty. That's, that can be pretty hefty, 8% of the purchase price. However, the carrying costs or annual property taxes of land holding in Belize are very, very low. And this is just a, a land tax statement there so you can get an idea of what that looks like. Uh, if we look in there, this particular property in City River uh, looks like a half acre of land. Uh, they're paying about 200 Belize dollars per annum, so about 100 US a year uh, for property taxes. Now we do have a speculation tax as well as business tax on rental income in Belize. Speculation tax is assessed on undeveloped land of 300 acres or more. Uh, this tax is to induce people to develop land. Uh, so government does not really take kindly to people that are uh, purchasing acres and acres and hundreds and thousands of acres of land and just sitting on it speculating uh, for the property uh, value to increase and thus this additional uh, tax, special tax to develop uh, large land holdings. There also is a tax on, on rental income. That's uh, 1.75% on, on gross revenue. And uh, there's a 5% tax on the unimproved value of land that relates to the speculation tax. Capital gains in Belize, well, we don't have capital gains. That's one uh, good tax news coming out of Belize. Um, again, the, the major tax that you would face and the major cost for that matter of pur purchasing real property in Belize is that stamp duty. Uh, afterwards, property tax. Yes, if you have some rental income or if you're holding thousands of acres or more than 300 acres, there are those specialized speculation tax and business tax, but capital gains is not something that you face in this country. Uh, Self-directed IRAs out of the United States, that's something that we've seen quite a few clients purchase real property with down here in Belize. And we've partnered um, with some investment houses uh, in the United States. So anyone that, that has a, an IRA and a self-directed IRA, uh, it may be something that, that interests you to invest in Belize. And I would invite you to reach out to our office if you have any questions or have any additional interest in using your self-directed IRA to invest in a condominium unit land, a home in Belize as an investment. 
Smart Viewing is a service that uh, was born out of the pandemic. We, our office has, has uh, viewed uh, many properties on behalf of people that couldn't travel to Belize during the pandemic. So we would um, attend to the property and give kind of a, uh, a non-biased third party point of view, videoing uh, that property, sending uh, photographs. And I can tell you that quite a few people uh, with our smart viewing service did purchase, not exactly sight unseen because they saw through our eyes on the ground here in Belize, uh, but without putting feet on the ground. Um, and I can say that we have some happy clients countrywide that, that did so and happy to be here now that the pandemic has uh, let up a bit. Some of the other services offered by our office, certainly real estate services, retirement and relocation services. Uh, we do deal with company law and business uh, advice and setup for those of you that may be interested in starting up a business in Belize. Uh, definitely uh, something that, that we can assist with and we have a lot of experience with. We do have a corporate department that incorporates uh, and maintains both domestic companies as well as uh, foreign companies or international companies. We can help out with bank accounts, uh, work permits, uh, registering with government for social security, uh, tax identification number, uh, hotel license applications for that matter. So we have a lot of experience with this and this is definitely something that we do. Also, uh, we have some other legal services and I invite you uh, to investigate lawbelize.bz. Uh, we do do a bit of intellectual property law, uh, trademarks um, and protecting um, various IP as well as uh, helping with the importation of your pets. So we, we interact with uh, Baja or Agricultural and Health uh, Association um, in order to assist and make a smooth transition for not only yourself, but also your loved ones, your loved pets, uh, should you decide to relocate to Belize. Rachel, back to you. I'll open it up to questions now. All right. Fantastic. Everyone, I hope you're taking notes over there. Obviously, there's a lot of information. We are recording this too, so we'll send it out afterwards. Um, I'm going to keep Ryan. I know we have your contact information over here. Guys, feel free to reach out to Ryan directly if you have any questions specifically about the closing process. Uh, his email address is there, ryan at lawbelize.bz, ryan at lawbelize.bz. And we're going to go through questions. Also, I realized I didn't introduce myself before, but uh, hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Jensen. I am the broker owner of Luna Realty Belize here in Belize. I've been here for about a decade and just been really understanding and learning the real estate world here. Uh, I'm specifically on the island, but also just investigating it countrywide. I was working with a real estate developer here for 10 years and then uh, branch out and open my own real estate company here. So um, there are a lot of other webinars that we have coming up. I call them the Belize Brief. So if you're interested in joining any of them, I can always add you to the update list, let you know what's coming next. We do a series of developer highlights and also what's going on in the marketplace. And then also what you're on now is the educational series. Uh, our next educational series is not until December, but it's about how to use your IRA to own real estate in Belize. So with that being said, we are going to go through the questions here. And I do, oh, this is a really great question, Felicia, because this is what Ryan and I were talking about the other day before our residency webinar. And she said, how does purchase of real property that's part of a development differ from purchasing a single family or solo unit residence? Sure. Um, thanks for that question, Felicia. You know, it really depends. It depends on that particular development. Uh, I would say that the best, uh, well, let me put it this way. We could be talking about a condominium development. We could be talking about a subdivision where there's individual homes uh, within a subdivision, but you own that land. Uh, so there's a lot of variables there. Uh, but you may be talking about a condominium development. And I would say that the best form of title there would be a strata title. Uh, essentially, that is a title for what I would call the box in the sky, as well as uh, a portion of the common areas. Now, that type of title, strata title, falls under the Registered Land Act. So you do get a land certificate. If you remember, that was the, the third form of title in Belize that I, I went through in, in those slides. Um, it's not really treated too differently as it relates to the process or the, the purchase process outside of the fact that you do have to uh, be cognizant of the fact that there are your typically homeowners association dues, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes called CAM fees. So you would wanna make sure, and, and this our office handles this as part of our due diligence process, not only do we investigate the, the title, but we're also interacting on behalf of our client buyers 
with the developer or homeowners association themselves or itself to ensure that all uh, homeowners dues are paid off, all fees, that there's no any outstanding liabilities. Um, if it was, how does that differ from a standalone home? Well, you're not gonna have those HOA fees. So that's something that's, that's really unique if we're talking about a condominium or strata title development. Uh, if it's a standalone home, really we're looking for property tax, uh, outstanding property tax. There might not be any CAM fees or HOA fees. So that's one major difference. Um, yeah, hopefully that shed a bit of light on your, on your question and answered. Uh, and too. also, you know, Ryan, this is a, a question for you too. So when somebody is buying into a condominium and there are the HOAs or they're buying into an area of development where there are HOA fees, is it true that the HOA document needs to be registered with the lands department? Is that something that you look into as well? Because that's something, um, you know, we've been told and, and talked about. So I just wanted to confirm with you since you are indeed the lawyer. Mm -hmm. Um. What was the question again there? Just oh, sure, sure. I know I had a lot of words there. Is that does an HOA agreement, right? So if a development yes. has an HOA agreement, mm -hmm. gives it out to the homeowner to sign, does that HOA yeah. agreement need to be registered with the lands department to be valid? Absolutely. Absolutely. In order to be enforceable and have teeth, it need it does need to be registered with the Ministry of Natural Resources, that's whether it. or not that's the land registry or the land titles unit. And why I mentioned these different registries, well, we have three different forms of title and we got a couple different registries as well. Uh, we're, ta we, we're talking about strata title. And I would tell you that the, the homeowner's rules or, or HOA guidelines, uh, the, the restrictive covenants, um, sometimes they're called. Those are actually uh, government mandates, certain restrictive covenants that come out of a strata title um, development. And so those call them laws or rules uh, that are provided by government or mandated by government. They're really talking about how your, what your ownership rights would be, uh, how the HOA, uh, the, what we call a strata corp, voting is done, uh, property rights as far as common areas are concerned. Um, it's very important that those are looked into as part of the purchase process to ensure that you know not only your rights, but also your responsibilities as it relates to owning in a strata title or some other type of, of development. But back to your question or the original question, absolutely. Uh, those rules, restrictions, restrictive covenants, homeowners association rules, there's many different labels. Yes, in order to be enforceable, they do need to be recorded with the government, with the Ministry of Natural Resources, Lands Department, Land Titles Unit, what have you. Got it. And is that something that your law firm can help with as they're going through the due diligence process? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's very important. Again, it, it, it depends on the type of property you're buying. But if you're talking about buying a, a strata title unit, a condominium, uh, that is absolutely essential uh, to, again, understand your rights and responsibilities. Uh, make sure that the seller is paid up as far as the responsibilities, liabilities for that particular unit. Um, and it is absolutely something that we uh, we conduct and look into as part of our due diligence process on behalf of our clients. Perfect. And I know Felicia was asking about, you know, is there anything different and, you know, in terms of the titling, you, I think, hit the nail on the head there in the different types of titles, you know, and I remember too, when I was working with this development company that we had different staged payments that were made during different progress, during the progress of the construction. So, you know, while in, in Belize, it is common 10% down, that's typically what you put down, you have the offer to purchase, then you go through the due diligence process. And then once that due mm -hmm. diligence process is completed, then the remainder of the, the payment is made. And so I remember it just being pretty different, especially when I was going through my own real estate purchase in 2016, because I was like, this isn't how we did it at the development, because we had more of the stage payment schedules. And then it was at the end, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here too, you can only process title once the structure is complete, right? You can't, I can't give title to the buyer if they're, the building's not complete yet, because how are they going to be able to, to assess that? So I do think that that's important to note too, is that you do need to wait until the title, the, the structure is actually complete to be able to get the title. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I see all different kinds of, uh, you know, pre-construction uh, mm -hmm. contracts and purchasing, but as far as title and title transfer is concerned, mm -hmm. you know, what you're speaking about specifically there would be the strata title again and yep. condominium complexes. Uh, yes. I mean, title is not even created uh, for the individual units by government until there is a substantial structure in place on the ground, something you can touch and feel. Um, and that's, it's very important to, to note that. Now, when we talk about 10% down, I, I should have said this before, that's tradition in movies, yep. but it's not by law. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I've seen 50% down, 5% down, all, all over the place. But I would say the vast majority of transactions that I'm involved with, it's a 10% earnest deposit that mm -hmm. is fully refundable uh, should our title search come back with problems. Um, mm -hmm. You know, problems that cannot be cured by the vendor. Uh, what we were talking about is, a, you know, some type of problem with the, the chain of title. Um, perhaps the seller does not own the property that they're selling or some, di you know, disaster uh, with regards to the title. That 10%, that earnest deposit is fully refundable. It's very important uh, to have that earnest deposit in an escrow account with a licensed attorney, uh, preferably an attorney that's looking out for you buyer's interest. Because if you paid that money over to the other side, uh, either a real a listing agent or perhaps the developer, seller, him or herself, uh, might be kind of difficult to disgorge that money uh, should something go awry. So it's always safer to have that in a, in a licensed attorney's escrow account, in my biased opinion. Yes, and I'm really glad earlier that you mentioned that you have a U.S. account, a U.S. dollar account, and then also Belize dollar account. I remember, and I think you were on this forum too, where it was one of those Facebook forums, and someone who was buying Belize for the first time was like, my realtor or my attorney had me or wanted me to send money to a U.S. dollar escrow account in the States. Is this a scam? Is this normal? And everyone's like, no, 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 it's not a scam. Talk to Ryan. <laughs> and it, it, you know, one of the big reasons for that is because a lot of the transactions that are typically being done um, you know, between buyers and sellers using, you know, Ryan services, for example, it's our foreigners, right? And so the real estate transactions are happening in U.S. dollars. I don't know many uh, foreigners who are buying real estate here, selling their property and then want Belize dollars from that, right? Most yeah. of them want U.S. dollars. Sure. So that's why it is common to have that account. Now, yeah, absolutely. I, I can elaborate on that just to, sure. you know, touch uh -huh. on that. Right? I would say that um, 95 plus percent of the real estate transactions that our office is involved with, uh, the, the transaction itself is denominated in the United States dollars, that there's no uh, change of currency or currency conversion whatsoever. It's United States dollars typically. Got it. And that is important to know because sometimes it can be a bit challenging or get a little a little expensive to change from Belize dollars to, to US dollars or, or vice versa. All right, so I know Ed, you're on the line with us here. Ed emailed questions over earlier, so I'm gonna read out those questions and I'm guessing a few of you have very similar thoughts because I see some questions coming in about financing. Ed is asking, what is the correct way to record owner financing? Uh, I would say the best way, the most rock solid way to protect your interest as a buyer borrower or as a seller lender would be what I would classify as a traditional mortgage or, or what you would know you might know as a traditional mortgage in North America. Uh, the, the, the labeling is a bit different here in Belize. We don't call it, well, for deeds of conveyance, we do call it a mortgage, but for registered land, we call it a charge, but essentially it is a mortgage. Um, we don't call it a loan agreement for registered land. We call it a memorandum accompanying a charge. So a document accompanying the, the mortgage. That uh, what typically happens in, uh, you know, owner financing or seller financing rather, uh, at closing, title transfers, title transfers from the seller lender to the buyer borrower. Uh, at the same time, a simultaneous uh, security or a security instrument, what we call a charge again, or mortgage in North America, is also lodged in the favor of the seller lender. Uh, what that does is it well, certainly puts public on notice that that property has been transferred under con beyond under contract. Title is transferred and there is a mortgage, there is a charge. Now it protects both sides because what will happen is, well, as long as that borrower buyer, uh, new title owner continues to make payments according to that memorandum or loan agreement, no problem, no problem whatsoever. And as soon as the final payment is made, there's actually a document called a discharge of charge. Uh, the equivalent to a cancellation of mortgage, where at that point, again, once the loan is completely paid off, that buyer, borrower uh, owns that property free and clear. Um, in the event that there is some type of uh, breach, uh, some type of uh, non-payment for whatever reason by that borrower, buyer, what's great about our laws are that that lender seller can actually uh, foreclose on the property without the assistance of the court. Now, there are some procedures, there are some written notices that need to be put in, um, and you need to follow the guidelines of, again, that memorandum of charge or loan agreement. But if there is a, uh, if there is a breakdown and a non-payment, that seller, lender, 
can foreclose on the property, can sell that property at auction. Of course, there's no, uh, there's no allowance uh, for a, a windfall for that lender. It's not like they can keep 100% of the profits. They can pay themselves after that auction, the outstanding loan amount, whatever that borrower owed to the lender. And then the profits afterwards would go to that, uh, that buyer borrower. Of course, they no longer own the land that's been foreclosed on, but it does protect both interests. Uh, and that uh, is, is what I feel is the strongest way to secure one's interest, uh, either as a borrower or as a lender in Belize. Uh, you don't see it happen too often out in San Pedro, uh, but I would say it depends on who you're getting advice from. That's the, uh, that's the best way, in my opinion. Perfect. And they can register the, the mortgage or the charge with you, right? Correct. Absolutely. Uh, we handle that all the time. Um, it is, there are legal documents that need to be drafted. Again, the charge uh, instrument itself, the memorandum accompanying a charge, a loan document. But it's, um, although the labels may be different than, than what most North Americans may have heard, uh, it's essentially uh, a loan agreement with an amortization table. Uh, it doesn't look all that different. It is, again, what I would call a, a traditional mortgage in North America. Perfect. And then this is part of that question from Ed earlier too. He said, does the property, well, this, you kind of answered this, but I'll ask it anyway. Does the property remain under the seller's name until the loan is paid off and then the seller releases the caution or can it transfer to the buyer and then the caution get removed at payoff? Okay. Um, well, in, in what, I, again, what I call a traditional mortgage or a traditional charge setting, again, title is transferred at closing into the borrower buyer's name. Uh, and then again, the secured interest of charge is filed. Uh, you make mention of, of a caution. That's actually a label um, that we use in Belize. In North America, you would call that a lien. So it is not a mortgage. It's not a secured interest in a property from a lender. Uh, it is simply a lien. And the biggest difference is that caution, um, the commissioner of lands can remove that caution. A judge can remove that caution. Uh, it's not, it doesn't have as much teeth as a charge mm -hmm. or mortgage would. Um, so that's the big difference. Um, and, I, and I think it's, it's important to, to understand uh, the different labels, the different terminology used in Belize with regard to, to real property law. Interesting. I didn't know that. So I'm glad that you, you mentioned that. So charge is as more teeth than a caution does when it comes Absolutely. to- Absolutely. And think about yeah. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, in North America, um, a mortgage, a lodged mortgage has more teeth than a lien or mechanics lien, what have you. That's sure, it's far sure. lighter. Certainly it freezes the uh, the title for a, a set duration of time, uh, but it could be argued. And again, that there, there are, there's more than one person and not just the Supreme Court that's empowered to remove a caution in Belize, where if we're talking about a charge or mortgage, well, that's not the case. You certainly would, you could sue to be, uh, to, to remove a charge. But other than that, um, there is a, again, memorandum of charge, a loan agreement that is lodged, that is recorded at the registry uh, and that really governs the transaction. Interesting. Okay. And I see Ed seeing here, he wants to meet with you. So I'll just go back to the slide there with Ryan's info, ryan at lawbelize.bz. And Ed, be great for you just to reach out to him directly. I know you got some specific questions on there. All right. Ernie is saying, what is the general feeling of the local Belize people of foreigners buying Belize real estate? I would say, you know, in my opinion, um, a you know, Belize, I just read another article this week. Belize is one of the friendliest places in the world, they say. Um, I don't think, in my opinion, that there is a, a backlash of, of foreign buyers um, in Belize or, or from a local perspective, um, they do not want foreign buyers here. I think everyone is very friendly. I think they can, you know, the average Belizean appreciates that foreign direct investment, people bringing their money, investing in this country can only help our developing nation grow. Uh, so I think it is... Uh, I believe, certainly from a government perspective, and the majority of Belizeans on the ground, I would say open arms, please come come invest in our country, uh, help us grow. Yes. And, you know, the uh, one other thing I do want to mention is here in Belize, it's the first 66 feet of land from the water. So that coastal land there is called Queensland. And so it's owned by the Queen, but technically nobody owns it, right? It's public access way. So you, everybody from locals to foreigners to visitors, whomever are able to walk up and down or ride their bicycle up and down that road. And I think that that really helps too. And I always just like think about California where you know, the life of the rich and famous, where there are those beach parcels that those uber wealthy people own and nobody's allowed to walk on their beach, right? Because it's, it's private beach. And so 
here, I think that that's a nice advantage too. Um, it doesn't necessarily answer your question specifically there, Ernie, but I think it helps to create a sort of community here in the country where everyone's really coexisting. You know, you have the locals who are coexisting with the expats who are coexisting with the tourists. And for me, that was one of the big reasons why I really love it down here because you do have these these relationships that you make and friendships that you make with with everybody, right? It's not just whoever was within your community. It's a very, very friendly place. And I totally agree with the article saying that Belize is one of the friendliest countries in the world there. All right, here's a great question from Robert. He's saying, is it better to obtain a mortgage in Belize or the States? Well, uh, I think you'd be hard pressed to, to find a lender, a bank in the United States is gonna provide you with a mortgage for land located in Belize. It's a completely different legal system. Um, it's a completely different jurisdiction, a different country. I've not, I've not encountered a mortgage uh, from a lender, a, a financial institution, a commercial bank in the United States lending money uh, to purchase land in Belize. So it really doesn't, uh, doesn't happen. So Belize would be the most appropriate place. And I, I should say that, you know, unless you have uh, an immigration status in this country, permanent resident, national, uh, what have you, uh, you're not really gonna have good luck trying to borrow or obtain a mortgage from one of our domestic banks. Um, some of the international banks do provide financing for foreigners, for non-residents, uh, it's typically not 100%, maybe 50% of value. Mm -hmm. And I would tell you, in my opinion, that the, the terms of that particular financing as compared to certainly uh, interest rates and, um, and stipulations, not so friendly as compared to what you may know from North America or maybe more comfortable with. So not really a great place to borrow, um, but a fantastic place to buy. It's it's true. I know of one bank at this point that is allowing foreigners to get loans. It's very difficult of a process, so it takes quite a bit of time. They'll require a ton of information from you, um, but that's also what's needed by central bank here. So then they are just like you said, it's 50 percent down. So what a lot of times people tend to do is they'll look for opportunities where there's the seller financing and seller financing, you know, maybe somewhere around the same terms, but at least you have a little bit more flexibility with the seller to, to negotiate on that. All right, next question I'm seeing here is from JC. He's saying on the speculation tax, is there a time frame on which to build in order to avoid the speculation tax? Uh, no, there's not really a time frame per se. It's again, you know, if you if it's a, a, a parcel that's 300 acres or larger and it's undeveloped um, and an assessment is made by the Ministry of Natural Resources, that it is an undeveloped large parcel of land, that's when you, uh, you're assessed that speculation tax. So no, there's not a time frame once you buy it to have it developed to, to avoid that, um, unfortunately. All right, perfect. And Ed, I'm seeing some pretty specific questions from you here. So I'm gonna let you and Ryan discuss those offline. And then John is saying, good question here. When does the seller get their funds? When does the seller get their funds? Uh -huh. um, in a, let's call it an, a, a traditional cash deal. The seller would get their funds at closing. And what I would classify at closing is when we, if our office is representing a buyer and we have the, the title transfer instruments, stamp duty is paid. And I did see another question here, when is stamp duty paid? Mm -hmm. That's paid at title transfer, just prior to title transfer at closing in Bellopon at the registry. They will not record a transfer unless you're showing that stamp duty has been paid. So it happens right then and there. Once those documents, the title transfer documents have been lodged, recorded, and this is post filing fees, post stamp duty fees being paid. At that point, our office releases funds to the seller near simultaneous. Once those documents are accepted by the registry, we turn around and release funds according to the instructions of the seller. Typically what that is, is a certainly uh, sell proceeds to the seller. We may be paying off uh, various commissions to any real estate agents that were involved in the transaction, but it's right there. It's at closing or near, you know, as simultaneous as possible, as close as we can get right there when the transaction has been uh, consummated. All right, fantastic. All right, next I'm seeing here from David M. He's saying when purchasing a condo in a development, the developer seems to offer the service to process the title. Should you also have another lawyer to represent the buyer in working with the developer? Uh, well, my answer is going to be a little bit biased. I <laughs> think that there would be a conflict of interest there. Um, if you are asking the developer, who is essentially the seller, to 
verify and confirm that they have good title to the property, to handle the preparation of title transfer instruments on your behalf, uh, to conduct all those legal services. Um, I would say, well, first and foremost, they shouldn't be doing that. They're not a licensed attorney. They're, in, they're engaging in the, in the unlicensed practice of law, but they are conflicted terribly. Um, in my very biased opinion, again, I think you should have a third party, uh, your own legal counsel looking out for you and only you uh, with the, and give them your, you know, to get their unbiased uh, legal opinion and advice. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> Awesome. And so Jennifer is saying, I live in Belize and want to strata title my property. Do I have to pay stamp tax again? Uh, actually, no. I mean, there's certainly going to be costs as far as what I would call stratifying that property. You have to get a licensed surveyor involved. Uh, there's a lot of legal documents that, that need to be prepared. But once your, your property has been, again, what I would call stratified, although that's not, a le that's not legal terminology, once it's been stratified, uh, essentially subdivided, but boxes in the sky, condominium units typically, stamp duty is paid upon transfer. So it's really when you're selling off those various units, individual units. And although it does, our Stamp Duties Act does not state that that is a, that stamp duty is a cost to be borne by a buyer, it is tradition and believes that that is a buyer's expense. So to answer your question, yes, stamp duty must be paid, but it's typically picked up by your end result buyer of those individual units after stratification. Right, that makes sense. And obviously, like you mentioned, there will be fees to stratify. Is that the word stratify mm -hmm. the property? Uh, it's, it's kind of terminology that I made up. So I, mean, I like it, it, I like it. <laughs> yeah, it's making an application under the, the Strata Titles uh, Registration Act. Uh, uh, you're not going to find that stratified term within the act itself, but it kind of encapsulates what we're talking about here. I love it. I'm going to start. I'm going to adopt that word there, Ryan. Um, but no obviously, problem. there will be there will be the fees for it. So that makes sense. All right. Here's a great question from Steve. He's saying, "I'm selling one of my lots at Secret Beach and wanted to keep the proceeds in Belize for a future residential purchase. I do not have a bank account in Belize at this time, and wanted to know if it is possible another way." Um. Well. I are you talking about Belizean dollars, United States dollars? I mean, I'm going to guess Belize dollars. Belize dollars. Well, yeah. is there another way? I guess you could, you know, put it in your sock drawer under your mattress cash, but that's probably not the best <laughs> way. Yes. Uh, here's another idea. Our office offers escrow services. Mm -hmm. Certainly escrow services as it relates to a transaction, uh, holding funds pending a closing, but we also hold funds on behalf of our clients. Mm -hmm. uh, so certainly there are fees involved, but if you needed a temporary place to park your money, before you decided on how to reinvest it in our country, uh, we could hold that in our Belize dollar escrow account. I would caution you on using, you know, escrow services from unlicensed uh, persons. Uh, certainly, licensed attorneys at law are the only, you know, the only persons entities that should be conducting that type of activity. We do have uh, professional guidelines and laws that govern the practice of law in Belize, and certainly the holding of, of client funds. So I would say that that's probably your, your best bet or safest bet. Use a licensed professional. Perfect. And Steve, you know, a lot of the transactions do end up happening in U.S. dollar too. So you can always just have it happen in U.S. dollar. And then when you do your next purchase, it can, it most likely would be a U.S. dollar transaction as well. So at least that way you have the U.S. dollar, U.S. dollar there. And I don't know if that was just so you'd have to report tax or anything, but I just say be careful with that because IRS is always looking out for Americans who are doing transactions overseas. All right. Um, a great question here, Michael. And he's saying, hi, it's Liz and Mike from Maryland. Nice to have you both on. Can you state the pros and cons of the IBC option of a land purchase? Really good question. Can you state the pros I've and cons seen, of an IBC? Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> just <reading> again. <laughs> all different types of scenarios and different structures that are being sold uh, by developers. Pros and cons, I mean, there's so many variables here. You know, what are we talking about? We have Belizean IBCs right now for about a month or two until they're all gone with our new Belize Companies Act of 2022. I know that there are some developments uh, in the country that are uh, attempting to sell IBCs set up in foreign jurisdictions, not Belize, and telling the you that, you know, that, it, that IBC owns or has title to real property here in Belize. You know, I'll tell you the cons. The cons are you don't know what that company has been used for. I mean, you know, you, 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 you have to believe what the seller is telling you that 
that company has not engaged in any uh, entering in into any contracts, that there's no liabilities. It's very difficult when you're, when you're talking about buying a company uh, because there's not a central uh, registry of contracts, of, of mortgages uh, for companies, of liabilities. So in my opinion, uh, if I were to be purchasing land and I wanted to use a holding company, and there certainly are a lot of benefits and pros for using or utilizing a holding company, one of them being uh, limitation of liability. Certainly, if you're going to have tenants, renters, um, we have tort litigation in this country. Someone slips and falls, breaks their leg, gets hurt. They sue the landowner. Well, if there's a holding company that's a landowner, typically the only asset of that holding company would be the underlying land, the property itself, uh, not your personal assets, the owner of that property. So you can, there's a, a, a huge benefit about, of using a holding company uh, for uh, owning rental properties. However, I would want to set up my own company that's brand new and fresh and I know it has no liabilities and I know how much it costs and what the annual maintenance fees are and all of that. I mean, there's another con of this, uh, you know, a, a detrimental effect of these uh, preformed structures. Um, I would say, ask, how much is that going to cost you to maintain that company? Who's a registered agent? What does it cost per year? Uh, what are your carrying costs? And realize that you may be stuck with those additional costs forever. Uh, who are you dealing with if you're dealing with somebody, uh, a registered agent in another Caribbean island or jurisdiction or somewhere in Central America? There's a lot of questions there that, that would make me feel uncomfortable. And again, I am a big advocate for the use of holding companies when it relates to investing in rental property or property that's going to have a rental return, guests, tenants, what have you, hotels for that matter. However, I think that it's, it's in your best interest to set up that type of structure yourself uh, or get advice on a brand new structure, a brand new company uh, to take title under your terms, um, again, in my personal opinion. Yeah, and that's really, really smart. I didn't think about a lot of those those cons, but it makes a lot of sense. And so what the seller can do then is obviously just transfer the property from the IBC that it's in to your new holding company Absolutely. or to your new company and go from there. So yeah, that's Absolutely. that's really, really good advice. And obviously Ryan can help with that too in setting up the company. So, you know, yeah. and everybody too, everyone has different reasons for wanting to set up the company. Maybe it is the liability. Maybe it's just trying to protect your assets. Maybe you're trying to make it easier for your heirs down the line. And so what I would say is obviously it's 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 easy to give an overall general answer, but if you guys are looking for something more specific, just contact Ryan and his, and his office and and be in touch with what you're looking to accomplish and why you are trying to uh, do that. And I saw, Ryan, I'm going to go back to your services for one second, mm -hmm. because sure. this is something yeah, that... I think that was a good point, Rachel. I mean, please do, you know... You know, listeners, uh, participants here. I'm I'm answering these questions in a very general sense. Mm -hmm. uh, when you ask about you know pros and cons of an IBC, I mean, there's so many different type of companies, different jurisdictions, different reasons to use one jurisdiction over another based on tax treaties that Belize has with these countries. So um, you know, don't take the advice I'm giving you as concrete, specific advice, and take it more in a general sense. But I would love to speak to you one on one uh, to 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 really provide tailored advice for your particular situation. Yeah. And what I wanted to point out here is actually the third one is the wills, the probate wills, estates, because a lot of times people just completely forget or don't even realize that they should be creating a will in the country that they're investing. Maybe at their will in their states or Canada, wherever they're from, they're putting something, oh, I have property in Belize. I want to leave it to my children. But at the end of the day, I would just highly recommend everybody has a will in any country that you're investing in. Get that will registered there in the country with an attorney so that it is easier for your heirs down the line. I'll keep that on for a little bit more so people can see what else you do. And I know we only have a couple more minutes here. So I'm going to go through a couple more questions is from Felicia is saying at settlement of a condo purchase, is there a line item entry that reflects the first $10,000 allowance that is not eligible for stamp duty tax? Should I look for that in the settlement? And that's 10,000 US, 20,000, please. I'm going to go back to your slide about that too. Yeah. I mean, is there a line item entry? I mean, it really depends on the developer, the seller. Um, if, you know, if you have representation Felicia, as far as a licensed attorney at law, we would certainly be looking to ensure that you um, that you are taking advantage of that allowance, that uh, that exemption of value. Um, I guess you know it really depends on the, the condo developer or the owner of that condo uh, whether or not, first of all, if they know about that allowance or they know about that exemption rather, uh, and are are telling you about it and 
and putting that there as a line item, um, it depends. Yeah, and what I would even say is ask for a breakdown of the fees, right? Absolutely. You, know, you can see then what is being given to the lands department for that stamp tax. You can see what the registered agent is getting for the, the process. So you definitely want to get a breakdown of, of what those fees look like. All right. Um, and anonymous attendee is asking for information for builders. I don't know who you are because it says anonymous and attendee. So just email us and we can get you some recommended builders. And I'll go back to the contact info. Sorry, guys. I got a, we got a lot of slides here and I don't want to bog you down on the slides. I'm going to ask this question from Robert while I get to that last slide. Robert saying, can we purchase soon if we are not re relocating for four or five years? No, um, no need to be physically located in Belize to purchase real property in Belize. <laughs> we want you to come down, but no, no need for you to ever come to Belize to be a property owner here in Belize <laughs> for that matter. Uh, but certainly come down and walk the land. Again, we we uh, offer that that virtual uh, viewing service. We can check it out for you, but uh, certainly you can purchase, you can invest in this country prior to actually physically putting your feet in the sand. Perfect. And, you know, I would, from the real estate side, I can tell you that that's what we're seeing a lot of folks are doing. They're doing the, the research period, or they have been doing the research period, owning now, putting it into the rental market, and then they are coming down to live in four, five, six, ten 10 years, whatever their timeline might look like. You know, everyone knows prices are going up, inflation numbers, whatnot. So things are just getting more expensive. So, you know, by owning now, then you're you're saving yourself what the, the cost would have been in five years and hopefully earning some rental income from it. All right. So I have two final questions. They're going to be very quick. Ed is saying who can do a strata division. You can make that one quick, Ryan, because I know that uh, Ed's going to chat with you later, too. Uh, which what was the question here? I'm, I was actually looking through. Oh, um, sure. Sorry. I'm like, and I'm Sorry. clicking yes answer. Okay. Um, who can, who can do the strata division? Who can do a strata division? If you have that piece of property already, you want to turn, I guess what you mean. Well, our, off, our office can assist. I mean, we uh, often, uh, you know, take the reins and guide you through the process, but really a lot of the work, a lot of the heavy lifting uh, would be done by a licensed surveyor. So they're coming out to the property. Um, they're drawing up surveys, plans, a lot of times architects are involved. If it's a new build, a new uh, building that has multiple units, condominium uh, structure. Uh, but our office certainly can assist and, and guide you. Uh, mm -hmm. There are quite a few legal documents uh, that need to be produced. And as far as the submission itself of the, the strata plan to the lands, uh, land registry, uh, we can help out with. So if you need help with that or more information, we can certainly help, but I don't want to tell you that we deal with it 100% because, again, there are other professionals, licensed professionals involved, including licensed surveyors, sometimes architects as well, engineers sometimes as well. Awesome. And then the final question here before we hop off, I know we're just about at the hour. George is saying, can you recommend a Belize bank for a U.S. citizen to use? Uh, when you say a Belize bank, I mean, we have two different banking regimes in this country. We have international banks. We have domestic banks. The difference being the currency used. So our international banks, you could bank in Canadian dollar, Japanese yen, U.S. dollar, pound sterling, euro, if you're so inclined. Um, domestic banks, on the other hand, are Belizean dollars only. Um, we have a handful, about five, I'd say. I have my preferences. I'd prefer not to put that out here in a, in a public uh, environment but reach out to me. Um, I'd love to provide you with a consultation and, and let you know what I think, who I think provides good professional service. Um, I think some are a little bit better than others as far as uh, customer service, in my opinion. <laughs> it's true. And can you help people set up bank accounts too as uh, yes. foreigners here? Okay, see that's Absolutely, that's yeah, that is another service that we do provide. Um, I can tell you that, that you know, Applying for a bank account in Belize can be frustrating at times, especially if you're used to kind of the ease of the banking business or opening accounts in North America. Uh, it is certainly something that our office assists with quite a bit, uh, essentially providing you with advice, helping you put together the application, liaising with the bank on your behalf, providing you with a bank introduction, um, just making things a little bit easier, uh, even though it, it is something you probably do on your own. Uh, we try to, to help our clients avoid some of the uh, the frustration that may come with dealing uh, in, a, in a different banking environment uh, that they're not used to from wherever they're coming from. Yeah, that's it's a smart thing to do, especially if you're a non-resident of this country, because it is fairly difficult to get a bank account. It is possible, but it can be fairly difficult. And so I know for me, I waited until I had my permanent residency card because 
it was just something else with the bank when I wasn't a resident here. So I definitely recommend utilizing Ryan services there. So it's not as much of a headache for you. And with that being said, we're just here at the top of the hour. Ryan, any last words before we depart here? Uh, well, I want to thank you for inviting me, Rachel, and allowing me to speak to your guests. Uh, hopefully, there was some, some information that some of your viewers found, find to be uh, valuable. Um, I would tell you, you know, leaving your kind of final words with your guests, uh, Belize is a fantastic place. I think it's ripe for investment. I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. While at the same time, I think, I think that, you know, potential investors, uh, persons that are interested in relocating, should keep your wits about you. Um, follow your gut. If something doesn't sound right, if you're hearing something that just doesn't, just sounds off, uh, follow your intuition and, um, and confirm that with other licensed professionals to make sure that you're not being fed a line. Leave it with that. It's very, very, very good advice. Always trust your gut there. Alrighty folks. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for coming on. This is awesome. As always, I learned quite a bit tonight. So appreciate that. Thank you. And I just want to remind you folks that we are, we did record this. We are going to get this up on YouTube. It took a few hours the other night to get it up on YouTube. So I apologize if the email comes out a little delayed with the recording link. We certainly want to get that to you and uh, feel free to reach out as you have any other questions arise. Have a fantastic evening, everybody. And we hope to see you in Belize soon. Bye everyone. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night.